Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along to this HDB webinar. Um, apologies for the slight delay. Um, due to modern technology, we're having a few issues. And um, unfortunately, at the moment, Mark Stalham isn't able to join us on video, um, but he is here um, on the phone. And we're trying to um, fix this issue as we go along. Um, yeah, let's say welcome along to this um, latest installment in a series of HDB webinars. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm David Wilson, the Knowledge Exchange Manager for East Anglia in the Southeast for HDB Potatoes. Um, today, yeah, I'll say we're going to cover desiccation, um, a few bits of housekeeping before we start. Um, you will all be on mute at the moment. Um, don't be alarmed by that. Um, there is a, a question function there in the tab on the, the right. Um, so if you have any questions as you go through, please put them in there and we'll allow time for Q&A at the end. Um, we've got an hour set aside. Obviously, we're five, eight minutes late in starting. So um, we will try and make up for time. We've got some great content, so we don't want to rush through anything. Um, this is being recorded, um, so if you have to um, cut away, don't worry. Tomorrow, a recording will be sent to you all for anything you miss. Um, the Twitter handles are there if you want to get involved in social media. And after all, points make prizes. We've got basis and Naruto points. So again, in the chat function, if you could please add them in. Um, you'll also notice in this, this bar on the right hand side, there's a bit that says handouts, um, where there's some key summary slides for, for what you will be seeing. So moving on to the agenda, um, as mentioned, 60 minutes um, we'll be here for. Um, we're going to start off with, with Mark Stalham, um, who I hope is, is still here in the background. Um, he's going to do a summary of the 2019 um, HDB desiccation project. Um, then we're going to hand over to Eric Anderson, who's going to cover some um, desiccation in seed crops and what the work's been happening in Scotland um, and some of the implications around changes now we no longer have diquat. We then have a virtual um, farm walk where we go up to Spot North. Um, last year, my colleague Amber Barton arranged a very successful um, flail demonstration day, and we have captured that by video. So you'll see four of the, the leading flail manufacturers at work to see what they're like. Um, we'll then hand back to, to Mark Stalham you give us an outline of the, this year's desiccation project and what we're doing, what we're building on last year, and then we'll round things off with hopefully around 15 minutes of Q&A to really get to the bottom of some of the issues and questions you may have around what we show, and then we will close. But just for a bit of audience participation, as I appreciate you're all um, on, on mute, we're going to jump forward to a couple of polls now just to, to see how the land lies with you on farm. Um, so if I hand over to my colleague Christian, um, he can hopefully Get that to work. Yep, so it's pulled up there for you, David. You should be yeah, able to see it on the right. Yeah, so the first question there, yeah. What is your planned desiccation approach for the 2020 season? Um, flail alone, um, spray alone, or a flail and spray combination? Um, give it a bit of time. We've got half the people are voting. Um, don't feel the need to vote if it's not applicable, but um, yeah, interesting. I'll give it a little bit longer. Yeah, I think we can call it a day at that, Christian. There we go. So, 78% uh, resounding success for, for flail and spray, 18% um, spray only, and, and only 4% um, relying solely on flail. Um, we have one further poll to build on that. Um, and that is um, if you're using um, the flail and spray, which majority are. How long will you leave between flailing and spraying? Um, is it going to be the same day, one to three days, or three to seven days? Numbers are coming in quite well. Give it a few seconds longer. Yeah, I think we can wrap it up there, Christian. So there, yeah, we have 63% um, of you. Um, following up within one to three days with your with your flail. So um, hopefully that will tie in nicely with, with what Mark wants to cover. Um, so apologies, you won't be able to see Mark. Um, I will turn my face off, you have to look at me, and you can listen to Mark going forward. Over to you, Mark, if you can hear us. Okay, I can hear you. Hopefully everybody else can hear you. I'm looking at my own slides. I've no idea what else is going on in the project um, proposal 
um, because I can't see anything. So apologies, it was working five minutes ago. It's not working now, but we'll persist with that. Um, what I'm going to do is run through a summary of the 2019 results and then at the end of the talk return to what we're doing in 2020, which is really active at the moment because we're spraying currently and some uh, experiments have almost finished their work. So if we can click through to the next slide, please, David. Um, I'm hoping that you can now see a crop of the Spot North Wear uh, trial from 2019, just showing the end of effectively uh, the season. Um, if you can click forward to the next slide, please, David. What you're seeing here is a summary of the ground covers on this site from the point of T1 application onwards. And uh, what I'm really getting you to focus on is the area in the black square at the bottom, which is a summary of all the combinations of spotlight and goes eye um, averaged out together because there was no effect of any combination um, timing or rate on those particular chemicals. So just look in the black boxes. This is just one of the sites showing you where we got very good kill with all of the chemicals that we applied. But basically comparing the red control with the other chemical controls, you will see that pelagonic acid, final sand in this case, um, and spotlight goes eye were slower to actually kill the canopy completely. But by the point we got to three weeks after the T1 application, most crops were dead and there was no regrowth on this site. In fact, there was no regrowth on any site except the Spot Scotland seed site in 2019. We go forward to the next slide, please, David. Uh, this is what the crop looked like. You can see here um, the ground cover grid imposed. It's 99, 98% ground cover. The crop is beginning to yellow, and that's the point we applied our T1 sprays or our flail application. So you can see here the next slide, please, David, which is post flail. You can see the material, leaf material, dropped into the furrow between two rows. You can see the wet conditions creating compaction, and you can see the chop length that we've got on the stems there at Spot North. Okay, next slide, please. So what I'm gonna show you now is just some pictures basically two weeks after the initial application of uh, chemical or flail application. So next slide, please, David. So you can see here, two weeks later, the ground cover on the control plots has gone down by about 20%. Um, stems are beginning to desiccate, but there's still green material there. So this is just natural senescence. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the flail treatment, and you can see there, this has had flail plus a spotlight treatment going on one week after the flail. So we'll bear that in mind with uh, the treatments for 2020. So that's the distance between the flail and the T2 application of spotlight is one week here. And you can see there desiccated stems and virtually no home at all left in the central alleyway. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is the reglone treatment. You can see a little bit of green on three or four stems there. Leaf material still dead. And this is two weeks after T1. Next slide, please. And then this is the spotlight goes eye combinations of which there were four in this experiment. You can see there that there is some green stem material much higher up the stem, but all of the leaf has actually gone at this stage in terms of greenness. Next slide, please. Um, this is pelagonic acid, and whilst all the leaf material's gone, you can still see, see some green berries and very much more green stems um, in that ground cover grid. Not everything is there desiccated two weeks later. Next slide, please. And then this is the Soltex, which at this site had very good kill. It was applied on a hot, uh, reasonably windy day. Uh, we've got complete cover kill, and the stems are as desiccated as they are with the reglone treatment. So that's a quick summary of a site where we got good levels of control of canopy growth and desiccation with chemicals being applied um, at basically the beginning of September. So we move on to the next slide. Um, it, this is what we're basically trying to, to assess. We're not trying to assess the rate of decline of canopy for skin set. We're trying to measure the skin set of the crop. So what we've worked through here is a very aggressive skinning barrel. And the next slide, please, will show you what we're trying to achieve in terms of skin set. 
And of all the numbers that I will put up in this presentation and the one at the end, what we're trying to do is get an average surface area removed of less than 15%. So if the numbers in these columns are less than 15%, then effectively these tubers would go over the harvester and be able to put into store with minimal scuffing damage, providing settings are correct and operators are working you know, at an optimal uh, rate. So you can see there that if we look at the black box, the, the reglone, pelagonic acid, spotlight, flail, and saltex treatments, all uh, basically two weeks after T1 application had all reached that magic number less than 15%. So in this case, very good example. So we're not just looking at skin sets. So if you move to the next slide, this is, whilst it's not a summary, it just points to some of the differences that we may potentially expect. This is internal defects or vascular staining or semen necrosis. And summarizing this, we found no chemical or mechanical effects on any internal defects, as shown here, just an example of Reglone, any external pathology, so that's either rotting diseases or surface blemishing diseases, or any problems with stolon adhesion that were related to chemical or mechanical treatments versus the control. So we saw no effects of most of the or all of the chemicals on internals and pathological defects. Now the next slide, please, we'll return to the sort of issue of what, what Eric will say and myself is passive bulking, which is basically what happens when you don't kill the crop immediately is that there's a chance for tubers to increase inside as net photosimilate continues to increase through those leaves that are still remaining. The work that we did um, overall in 2019, and this is just one example of Spot North with Maris Piper, did show very little evidence significantly of actually any of the chemical versus mechanical treatments. But if you sum all seven sites from 2019, the fail and the mechanical treatments being either home pulling or flailing did actually stop yield quicker in terms of one or two days than the chemical treatments. But all of the chemical treatments were similar in terms of their cessation of growth. But you can see there, there's about an, an eight to 10 ton difference in the yield that has been lost by doing something at desiccation rather than leaving the crop growing on. So Eric will return to that later on. Next slide, please. So basically, whilst the ground cover sh showed uh, that we could have instant canopy death, um, little regrowth in most of the experiments, apart from one seed experiment, there were chemical differences in the way that we remove leaves and the timing of that. However, all of the spotlight goes eye straights or combinations were only two to four days slower in killing leaves completely in reglone as an average over all the sites. But pelagonic acid was the slowest to act on leaves. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it had the same knock-on effect in terms of skin set. So next slide, please. So very simply that just doing something actually improves skin set, but not immediately. Well, what I mean there is that it sometimes takes a week to 10 days before you start to see treatment differences compared with the control, even though the canopy is beginning to die quite rapidly under chemical or mechanical means. And if we looked at the combinations of spotlight and gozai, in terms of skin set, they were only one to two days slower in setting skin than reglone, mechanical, or Soltex treatments. In reality, with the very vigorous crops, seed that was actually harvested uh, very early, then skin set often took nearly four weeks. And in terms of skin set for Royal, right at the end of the season in September, it wasn't sufficiently skin set to harvest even after four weeks. So there's a range there of between two and four weeks in actually setting skins. Um, yield, what I've talked about in the previous slide, um, and I've talked about the effects of internal defects and, uh, and, and vascular staining. Um, same with Solon detachment, there were no chemical or mechanical effects. Okay, next slide, please. So if we were to look at this in, in, in the overall averages of the chemical treatments there, we will actually look that pelagonic acid, spotlight dose are actually not meeting the requirements for skin set overall at a three week post-harvest interval. So somewhere between three and four weeks, 
most of these treatments would be ready. Some sites earlier, you'll see that in a moment, some sites slightly later. But in reality, the average differences there between, say, Reglone and Pelagonic Acid is really only about one to two days delay in skin set overall. Okay, next slide. But obviously, there's a lot of growers out there listening and saying, my site is different to this. And you can see this on these data here, where if you look at the value of 15% at three weeks after T1 application, you'll see a large number of these sites actually haven't reached that criterion to actually um, harvestable. And this is real, the problem we've got, that site variation, application um, conditions and so on make quite big differences. So looking at an average result hides a lot of these data here. So that's just a summary and we'll return to that um, when we talk about 2020. So effectively, if we can move to the next slide, which is the last one in this presentation, which is basically the practical recommendations if you want to know what came out of the 2019 data set. Very simply that, yes, looking at ground covers did not give a close correlation with the skin set. Rapid death did not always mean much more rapid skin set. If you're going to apply PPO desiccants, so Spotlight and Gozai and their equivalents, then really aiming for early to mid-morning application would be good to give the chemical the longest period of time. And if you're flailing, giving the adequate amount of stem to remain to, to, for the chemical to target. And Eric will talk about that as well. Um, as mentioned, this one to two day delay in the uh, basically slower acting chemicals for, for defoliation, but you need to factor that into a harvesting schedule, obviously. So one of the things that we did notice was all of the crops that responded within two weeks in terms of getting skin set were showing signs of active senescence. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, loss of ground cover, typically two to three percent, a yellowing and a sort of hardening of the leaves. At that stage, chemical treatments were very effective in taking the crop down. Where the crop was seed and vigorously growing or had copious amounts of stem for a late uh, desiccated royal crop, then that was where we had more difficult conditions. Those crops were still actively growing. So faced with that, we gave a recommendation at the agronomist conference last year that maybe we should try 10% less nitrogen than the RB209 recommendation, or if you had difficulty killing a crop, just to try a strip of 10% less nitrogen in 2020. And we'll see where that's got to in terms of the 2020 trials a little bit later. However, our skinning barrel means taking tubers away and assessing them, and it's quite aggressive. What we really would like is a more quantitative, i.e. it's something that we can rely on between operators and rapid measure of skin set in the field. And I'll report on that a little bit later. Very simply, you know, I've summarized all the importance of, you know, the, the, the effect on yield and lack of effect on um, uh, rotting or blemishing diseases. But as Eric is going to mention in a moment, um, even two to three percent ground cover remaining for three to four weeks actually leaves as an ingress or blight or virus infection coming in. And so the killing of a crop is still important, even if it's skin set that you're after for wear. Okay, next slide. And that's the end of my talk. Over to you, David. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Um, that was absolutely seamless, as if you were driving it yourself. Um, so thank you very much for being accommodating. Um, um, as I say, there'll be a chance for Q&As at the end. We've got questions coming in thick and fast already, um, but please do put them into the, um, the question function on the bar. And in the handouts, you'll see the summary table of the different trials with the varieties and also the practical recommendations. Um, now we're going to move on to more of a focus on the seed side of things. Um, so before I hand over to Eric, let's just start things off with, with another poll. But this is specifically aimed at seed growers. So if I ask Christian if you could possibly go again. Um, yeah, so um, for seed growers only, when would you apply your last insecticide? Um, would it be at desiccation, so T1, um, 14 days before T1, or 21 days before T1? Give people a bit of time to get their votes in. Great to see so much um, engagement from, from you, the audience. Give it a few more seconds. Well, that's great. If you can take it there, Christian. There we go. Yeah, 50% of you 14 days before um, T1, 
and 40% at T1 with, with just yeah, less than 10% um, 21 days or more before. Um, so hopefully that will set you up nicely for, for what you're going to talk about, Eric. Um, and I will move to your, your slide and turn myself off. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Anderson, the Senior Agronomist for Scottish Agronomy and proud to be part of HDB's Spot Farm programme in, in Scotland, together with uh, Jim Reid, the host farmer, and McCain Potatoes over the next few four years. My whole objective in this uh, programme is to stimulate debate and discussion and to find practicable solutions for, for growers. I will discuss technology, the treatments we're applying this year at Murphy at St. Cyrus, um, I'm largely going to concentrate the discussion this afternoon on some strip treatments we've applied uh, at the, the spot farm and not the replicated field work that's conducted by uh, HDB. And then I'll mention some unintended consequences of the desiccation program. Next slide, please. Linking to the, the host farmer Jim Reed's application work, the principles of good desiccation are attention to detail. It's all about application, application, application. Now clearly water volume is a, a key component influencing desiccation spray efficiency. Normally when we're spraying crops of any kind, then in spraying good timeliness is achieved by having higher work rates. Lowering the application water volume is an effective way of increasing work rates and using higher spray speeds and wider uh, booms also help in this uh, manner. But all of these factors tend to increase spray drift, which can have an effect on contact herbicides such as desiccation products. When it comes through to desiccation, we've got to think about the quality of spray deposits that lands on the leaf in the upper, lower and, and mid canopy. It's the amount of leaf area in the target zone, the, the shape of the target, and clearly we've got horizontal leaves rather than uh, vertical leaves in a, in a cereal crop. We've got vertical leaves in a potato crop, we've got horizontal leaves. And we've got to think about the method of application, the droplet trajectory, the droplet size, the forward speed, uh, and, and the spray, spray volume. All of these will influence the actual result we get from choosing our desiccation uh, product and, and technique. And all of the desiccation products that were applied in this commercial trial I'm talking about were applied through a commercial sprayer. The applications were made through a Lechler IDTA 12004C. These are asymmetrical twin flat fan air induction or air injection nozzles and the first two applications in all the treatments were made in 400 litres of water. The third application was made in 300 litres of water. Now, as spray operators, many of you will recognise that you can't get the ideal application performance by using the same nozzle for every operation. All nozzles have a working pressure range and more modern sprayers with flow rate control systems, pressure isn't constant as you go up and down the field. You don't get the response quickly enough uh, when negotiating around obstacles, be it a pole or a edge of a field. And in potatoes, I think most operators would acknowledge they, they switch off the flow rate control and work with, with manual override. All this is important when considering desiccation at a practical level within potatoes. Next slide. So we were using these Lechler IDTA 12004C nozzles. The cost of a set of nozzles is about 570 quid for 60 nozzles. Uh, so we're using 56 of those nozzles in the uh, 28 meter sprayer. Uh, they're approximately costing nine pounds 50 each. Now, the, the key principles when we're thinking about spraying is forward speed. We were traveling at five point. Point. So the key principles are product choice. We were traveling at 5.5 kilometers per hour as in terms of a forward speed. We're looking for boom stability uh, and a boom height constant of 50 centimeters. And we're using 400 liters as a water volume. That gave us 1.84 liters per minute at four bar pressure. 
and between 2.1 and 4 bar, uh, these nozzles are rated as Lirap three-star nozzles for, for drift reduction. Importantly, as anyone who uh, is spraying will recognise that as you increase the, the height of the boom from half a metre being the, the, the target, anywhere up to a metre increases the drift by a factor of old. And typically, using extended range or variable pressure nozzles, as some of you may be using, they give more drift than, than conventional designs by a factor of two. Air induction nozzles give substantially less drift than conventional nozzles, but the boom height is important and it must be well controlled to take, take advantage of these drift reduction uh, principles. Now, these IDTA flat fan jets with asymmetrical spray pattern, they've got a 30 degree angle in the front jet relative to the perpendicular and a 50 degree rear angle relative to the perpendicular. So the front spray angle is 120 degrees, giving 60% of the spray volume with finer droplet spectrum to the front in driving the direction for optimum wetting. The rear spray angle is 90 degrees, giving 40% of the spray volume with a coarser, more drift resistant droplet spectrum. And these larger droplets have velocity, they've also got momentum to penetrate the crop canopy base and are less likely to get caught up in the air turbulence or the vortexing that takes place behind, behind the sprayer. It was only when we were going through with the third uh, chemical applications, we were dropping the volume from 400 down to 300 litres for the T3s. So that meant we were increasing the speed. Instead of travelling for the first two sprays at 5.5, we're increasing speed up to 7.3 kilometres per hour at four bar pressure. Next slide. It's important when we consider uh, the crop, each crop is different. And this is just a reminder that there's a world of difference in the challenge desiccating a processing crop versus that of a seed crop, processing crop on the left and a seed crop on the right. We've got to consider the physiological state of the plant, the crop canopy in a mooring crop uh, in the seed context uh, is strongly growing. Um, it's an early, um, second early variety but the crop is still growing strongly. As you see in the next picture, next picture, it's uh, in full flight and has got still flowers on it. We applied 84 kilograms of nitrogen to this crop, and we also applied um, SO3. Uh, we applied 700 kilograms of a 12, 11, 18 with 23 SO3. So that gave us, um, a lot of SO3, and we believe that that SO3 in the form of sulfate of potash is important in keeping the crop erect, being easier to rogue and also to, to inspect. It's also worth noting that these crops, when planted, we planted 77,510 tubers per hectare, um, and these were within um, 1.83 uh, centimetre beds or 72 inches. So although they are in strips, there's lots of replication within the plants themselves because the spray uh, area was approximately 0.2 of a hectare. So we've got lot, many thousands of plants. Each of them are acting as their own uh, replicate of the treatment. Next slide. You can see the, the vigorous nature of the crop here uh, as we were pre applying the first treatments on the 31st of July. The variety is Maureen. It's a uh, vigorous, uh, semi-determinate variety, group three. Next slide. When we were flailing, we were using a, a three-bed basilier. Uh, I've costed that in, in this presentation at 70 pounds per hectare. We were um, chopping 3.4 hectares per hour. But importantly, the bottom right-hand image there in red, you can see that the flailing can disrupt soil and increase soil erosion if heavy rain follows shortly after flailing. And we got a uh, very heavy rainfall, nearly three inches of rain occurred within 24 hours of the second uh, flailing treatment. And a lot of soil did wash down the, the, down the field. Additionally, wheeling compression damage to the side of ridge shoulders does cause slabs of soil to enter the harvester uh, and the primary web, requiring more agitation with the consequence potentially of causing more tuber damage and slower forward speeds. Next slide. It's worth taking time to 
set up flails properly for the best result. Clearly, laid home is particularly challenging, and I would offer some of the, the following uh, as practical pointers for machine operators. It's important to match tyre width and wheel alignment of tractors to the furrow width and soil conditions. We need to adjust the blade and knife alignment for the roll width to maximise the suction effect and avoid compressing the, the ridges. We've got to sh sharpen the blades for a clean cut and check the home guides are depositing it within the row bottoms to leave a clean target for the subsequent sprays and adjust the forward speed to the crop circumstances. Normally we're flailing within the range of 2.5 to 5 kilometers per hour for a seed crop uh, and we need sometimes to go slower in order to maximize the, the suction underneath the hood to clean all the debris away or as much of that debris away from the stem as possible. We want to leave a stem height of 20 to 25 centimetres, depending on the variety, but importantly, not scalping the stems so that there is a target for the T2 sprays. And the home canopy, uh, when collapsed or, or is lying prostrate, uh, that generally lies with the prevailing wind. So it is important that the operator can adjust the flailing height from, from the cab uh, on the fly as he moves up and down the field. And hydraulic control is essential um external top link adjustment in my mind is isn't sufficient for getting good operation within the field and i would suggest we need to leave between two and four days typically three days after flailing to uh, allow the the debris to fall off and allow a following up treatment to cleanly uh, target the, the the stem okay next slide Mark has already stated that the, the rate of home desiccation doesn't always well correlate with the, the rate of skin set. And I'm offering the, the following as a possible hypothesis for that. The green telephone uh, on the left-hand side is really a metaphor for the hormonal cascade events that occur through the plant that is initiated via the action of applying desiccation techniques. The phytohormone uh, that we apply uh, within the crop occurs normally within the, the growth and senescence of plants, practically in seed with indeterminate or semi-indeterminate varieties. There's a difference between flailing green and flailing seven days after a PPO inhibitor such as Spotlight is applied. And this really relates to the natural hormone cascade um, process that occurs within a plant. Herbicidal defoliants such as uh, gozai or spotlight injure the plant, causing it to produce ethylene, which uh, inhibits auxins and promotes abscisic acid, which starts to close down the plant. And although ethylene is recognized as a hormone that triggers senescence, abscisic acid is also involved in the process separate to the stimulation of ethylene production after you apply your chemical home desiccants. Next slide. These are two of the treatments we've applied um, in the spot farm uh, out of 12. Uh, treatment number one is chemical only, Spotlight Plus at a litre, plus Infinito as a uh, light spray, followed by 0.8 of Gozai, plus 0.6 of Spotlight Plus. And again, Infinito was added in there at 1.6 litres per hectare. And that was followed by 0.5 litre per hectare of Gozai and 0. Point, uh, sorry, 2.0 litres of, of toil. Now, treatment four is a flail treatment uh, followed by Spotlight at a litre and Ranman Top in, added in there as the light spray at half a litre per hectare, followed by 0. 0.6 of Spotlight Plus and Ranman Top again added in there as the, the blight spray. We have noticed that uh, in treatment number four there, there is a lot of, of regrowth occurring and that's common across all of the treatments that have been flailed, flail green. But the treatments that have the Ranman top added in as opposed to Infinito, there is uh, more aggressive regrowth taking, taking place. We'll continue to monitor that over, over time and our ambition is to be filming these plots on Friday so that uh, subject to the weather, 
so that we can capture that information and share that back with, with levy payers. Next slide, please. So here is the, the summation of the uh, LEAF scoring and STEM scores so far. Uh, one on the STEM and LEAF scores is green, nine is, is fully dead. And you'll notice there that treatments three, four, five, and six, which were the flail treatments, uh, flail green, are all showing a degree of, of, of regrowth. Uh, interestingly, treatment number two, which is pelagonic acid, which last year was one of the slowest to act on leaves. We learned from what we saw last year and this year with the aid of a mechanical roller pushing over the crop as a pre-treatment. What was the slowest treatment last year with addition of the mechanical solution is now one of the best uh, desiccation techniques in combination with the, the following treatments. So again, we're looking at mechanical solutions, not only nozzle choice, but mechanical solutions in answering the, pro the problems practically for, for growers. Interestingly as well, that treatment number 10 on that list, there is no regrowth. Now that is flailing, but the flailing in this occasion was preceded seven days prior to that with a liter of Spotlight Plus. That liter of Spotlight Plus was applied on the same day as the, the chemical treatments or the flail on the other, other treatments. Next slide, please. Yesterday on the underside of the leaves on the green flail treatments, it wasn't difficult to find uh, regrowth. And on that regrowth, within a few minutes, I was able to find peach potato uh, aphids, uh, both winged adults as well as uh, young nymphs. And in the right hand image, you can see uh, circled in red, uh, a young uh, peach potato aphid nymph. Now these are vectors of, of aphids. Uh, sorry, these aphids are vectors of um, potato leaf roll virus and potentially uh, PVYN. And even if this is a wear crop, you've got the, the challenge of foliar blight and there subsequently of, of tuber blight. Next slide. There's a lot of work around uh, going back to the 70s and 80s, much of which has been forgotten by, by younger agronomists. Uh, and even older agronomists uh, with, with, um, ha have forgot much of the data that we, we learned during that period. Work by Trevor Woodford and others indicated that virus transmission by insects was a highly variable process because it involved interactions between the virus, the vector and the plant. Peach potato aphids were the main vector and still are the main vector of potato leaf roll virus, but there was an attraction for the aphids because of uh, an olfactory, a, a smell cue, basically, that they zoned in on the volatiles from the, the host plants and the settling behaviour of aphids uh, was preferential on infected plants. And then they would, they would then uh, move that uh, infection onto to neighbouring plants. The work by Trevor Woodford at that point in time said that delaying the infector removal even just by eight days in July significantly increased the spread of leaf roll to neighbouring plants from 2.3% to 8.3%. And I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing an increase in leaf roll in some seed crops at this present point in time. In two, going back to 2019, we had 10 different treatments you'll see there from the box, raising from one to 10. And the level of mosaics and leaf roll when that material was planted back each in 0.2 of a hectare this springtime. It was inspected and it was rogued. And the difference in the number of rogued plants ranged from four in the best treatment, number one, to the worst treatment, number five, was 122 rogues out of a 0.2 uh, hectare uh, area. So that ranged from 0 0.04 up to 1.15% uh, virus. Importantly, mature plant resistance doesn't apply to PVYN, nor does it apply to potato leaf roll virus. And the industry has wrongly inferred the knowledge of PVYO to PVYN and massively to potato leaf roll. And many of you, when undertaking desiccation and burn down, uh, may not be thinking about the, the risks associated with virus ingress into, into the crop. Next slide. When we grade, as we did last year, 
the uh, progeny tubers from these crops in five mil size fraction, then we do start to uh, identify differences between treatments. And this is what I term passive bulking. So those treatments which are giving us slower uh, desiccation will rise into more passive bulking. And if we've got a very tight size fra fraction between 35 and 55 millimeters as a saleable fraction, then we can increase the uh, proportion of tubers that are going over size and they have got a lower or nil value. Next slide. So this is uh, my way of summarizing a decision guide for desiccation dependent on whether we're using chemical only, flail only, or uh, chemical and flail, whether you've got a vigorous crop or a senescing crop. In this chart, the, the toil rate is at 0.5% by volume, by water volume. So if you are applying 400 litres of water, the toil with the goes eye should be increased up to two litres per hectare. Next slide. As a summary, the key recommendations are that every season is different. Going forward, there isn't any blue each crop, each field situation needs to be assessed differently with the most appropriate treatment chosen. We've got to continue to develop both non-mechanical desiccation methods to facilitate vigor, vigorous home desiccation when the soils are too wet to flail. We are seeing passive bulking and that will require T1 treatments to be applied between three and seven days earlier than that you are perhaps more normally used to prior to the revocation of, of Reglone or, or Diquot in order to maintain target yield within the saleable size fraction. But it is essential to maintain both late blight and virus protection of the crop until complete cessation of all green material. Now, I note from the survey that a number of you were applying uh, the last systemic insecticide at least 14 days or more prior to the T1 treatments for desiccation. If the removal of all green growth is taking between 14 and 21 days, that gives us a period of between four and five weeks from the last systemic insecticide. These systemic insecticides are only going to last three weeks maximum within the crop, and therefore we have a gap that we need to address. I think, David, I'll end there and uh, await any questions. Thank you. Perfect. No, thank you very much, that, Eric. Questions are coming in, um, but in the interest of time, I will keep um, keep things moving forward. Um, Chris Hatt is in the handouts, available for people later on. Um, but in even better news, I'm delighted to say that Mark Stalin has been able to sign in and join us. He is now on camera, um, everyone can see him. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll now hand over to, to Mark for a bit of a summary of what's happening this year. Um, Apologies, we are going to run slightly over due to our, our later start, but we will have time for questions. In the meantime, if you want to claim basis of the ROSA points, please do put them in the, in the question box as well and keep your questions coming in. But I will sign out now and hand over to Mark. Thank you, David. Um, we did have a practice on this and it went seamlessly and I could hear everybody talking and then suddenly the system crashed. So we've done it by phone and apparently it worked okay but you're now seeing me live and i'll run through basically a summary of what we've started to attempt this year following on from the 2019 program so next slide please david so background um you've probably heard some of this already in relation to the first talk that we're trying to find alternatives and much like eric's work it's independent uh, advice. Um, there's no chemical manufacturer involved in guiding the decisions and it's sort of following on from the 2019 program though I've seen some of the questions coming in and it obviously can't answer all of the things that everybody wants to answer so you'll see where we're going with the treatment list. So very simply the 2019 data did demonstrate that we got different rates of canopy death as Eric has also alluded to and, and but they didn't always correlate with the degree of skin set that we achieved in the harvesting period that we've been expecting. So typically three to four weeks after the T1 application. 
and in the work from 2019 it did show that even where sites were slow to die and slow to reach skin stead, that those iron spotlight actually were similar to other chemicals if slightly slower by one to two days but it wasn't a week or more that uh, the out outcome of the project was maybe expecting in a difficult season. So work in 2020 should aim to strengthen this, look at some of the messages that we had from 2019 and answer some of the questions. Okay, next slide, please. So the 2020 aim is basically to find the best alternatives. And, and given the fact that, as Eric has alluded to already, these are replicated trials, which you will see, they are effectively on sites, which you'll see in a moment that are not as largely spot, host, um, spot farm hosts. And what we're trying to do is detect a range of indeterminate and seed crops where we're trying to take the crop down with vigorous canopy. So this links in with management of nitrogen and the RB209 recommendations um, in terms of for the sites. Okay, next slide, please, David. So the objectives are basically to provide a guidance on the best combination or desiccant uh, for non-chemical control as well as chemical control in a range of varieties at different sites uh, with different timings. Um, and basically link that with work that AHDB have funded already on nitrogen work, determinacy and cultivation in terms of managing soils or harvesting um, without bruising at the end of the season. And then optimizing the nitrogen rate so that we get rapid depth, that's the target. And um, we're testing a, a principle here. And the other one is, is basically, it's not just about harvesting without damage to the skins, it's actually having tubers that basically will not bruise but also don't have pathological issues because it's taking a long time to kill the foliage and they sit in a really dirty environment in the soil. The other one is that probably people remember Reglone and the SMART test from the late 1990s, early 2000s, where issues were raised with internal vascular defects and a split dose Reglone diquat treatment came out as a consequence of some of those potential risks. So we're being assessing those defects as well. Okay, next slide please, David. So practical recommendations, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just highlight here five of them. Very simply, um, this uh, discrepancy between the rate of foliage death and the rate of skin set, we need to answer that a bit better um, because visual symptoms may not always be indication of what's going on below ground. And therefore a more rapid and quantitative assessment, not just a thumbnail going on, a, on, on the skin of a tuber, um, is to, to give us some information about whether the tubers are actually set skin sufficient farms. And the other one is that we're looking at trying to manipulate the crop to get it into that point where you know, Eric's um, green telephone box works very effectively, that we get a combination of hormonal signals. Um, and that goes into flail and spray or spray and flail comes into this, this technique here. The crop is receptive, it's on that point of tipping over the natural hormones are already beginning to make that crop senesce in terms of skin set. The other one is about passive bulking. Eric's talked about it, um, I've talked about it as well. We're going to re reassess all of the sites in terms of their grading, particularly sites where very active um, death is important for controlling tumor size in salads or in seed. And the other one is just to retest to make sure that we have missed data on these internal defects in a very, what well, has been a really dry season in 2020. Okay, next slide please, David. So you can see the sites there, as I mentioned, they're all on spot sites. Unfortunately, due to COVID, they haven't been visited very much by big numbers of people. Disappointment, but the work has been ongoing. And you can see there, um, all of those sites have had a combination treatment, which you'll see in a moment. Um, basically, there's an interaction there with what we've been doing with nitrogen levels. So all four sites have had an RB209 recommendation created for them based on variety, overwinter rainfall and summer rainfall, the soil type and other combinations of factors of the site to, to influence that level of RB209 um, amount, so things like organic matter in the soil. And then what we've done to try and uh, basically get that crop in that advanced stage of, of senescence, so active senescence, is to take 15%, give or take, you know, whatever we can do in terms of, of, of turning the fertilizer um, settings on, 
is to reduce it by 15%. And you'll see where those combination treatments apply in terms of chemical use in a moment. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the combination treatments, eight. Um, we've got two controls where nothing is applied. Um, and we've got this RB209 and RB209 with 15% less N being applied in the seedbed. Um, we've then got our spotlight dozi combinations. Pretty much Eric's mentioned what they are. One liter of spotlight followed by 0.8 liters of gozai. In this case, with uh, a mineral oil addition of 1.5 liters per hectare, seven days after the T1 application. Following up a second dose of spotlight there, 0.6 liters. And then if required um, for the more indeterminate, or maybe more, maybe more vigorous crops, then there's the option to apply a second dose of gozai with the mineral oil combination at T4, which is effectively um, three weeks after the T1 application. We've got a single flail treatment with no nitrogen regime in there. Um, we've then got the pelagonic acid at the standard RB209, and that is then followed by the PPO combinations. In this case, gozai at T2 and spotlight at uh, T3. Again, with the option of having that T4 spray if we need it. Then we've got these two Soltex combinations, and I've just been talking to Cirque at Harper Adams today about them spraying tomorrow. Um, basically, in 2019, the Soltex rate was 100%, which was 1123 litres per hectare. And the programme that AHDB, the R&D committee and the steering committee gave to me was to have basically a half rate, so 562 litres, in combination as a tank mix with spotlight at one litre per hectare. So instead of allowing a time lapse, we've got two different modes of action there in a T1 spray, followed by Gozai um, at two intervals if we need the, the third one at T4. So those are the eight treatments. Most of them have this uh, combination of low and high levels of nitrogen. Okay, next slide, please. So you can see an experimental design there. All experiments are similar design, uh, different randomizations. You can see the green cells there are actually the RB209 treatments. Um, but basically what we've got is replicated eight treatments for replicates on all sites. Uh, last year we had five experiments like this and two de demonstrations, but they're all replicated experiments. Eight meter plots, two beds wide. Okay, next slide please. So there's our barrel, it's pretty aggressive. We have to take material back and skin it uh, following the harvest. Could we do something in the field? Next slide, please. So Bill Watts trialed this last year. It's a torque screwdriver with a hex adapter head and a one centimeter diameter wooden dowel glued to the end of that hex adapter. And what we do, and you can see Paul there, is basically pushing it down onto the surface of the tuber twisting it and then breaking the skin or periderm of the tuba and it records a reading in newton meters and the numbers you see there five eight ten or whatever are effectively 0.18 or 0.06 newton meters and what we're trying to do is is follow that procedure through to see whether we actually need to apply a t4 spray and then ultimately correlate those data whether they do or not with that skinning barrel that i've shown you in the previous slide Okay, next slide, please. So just revisiting 2019, basically we showed there that the chemical treatments, pelagonic acid and spotlight gozai, in reality, are only one to two days later in getting to skin set. But as I showed in a, a, another slide, the variation across sites is quite large. But nevertheless, the treatment directions are still there. That ranking still applies. In some cases, it's three to four days. In other cases, it's one to two days on average. Okay, next slide, please. So there's the data I alluded to, the variation there. The key is those sites where there's still 30% skinning occurring in terms of uh, sites which are three weeks. Those sites in reality are probably going to take four, maybe even five weeks to set skins. And what we're trying to do is look at in 2019 whether we've actually got better management with, with nitrogen as a treatment to control those, those, those varieties that are more difficult to kill. Okay, so next slide, please. So passive bulking, you've seen this slide already. Um, we'll be assessing yield. Uh, the first sites are, are very close to having yield assessments done. So that's the seed crop in Scotland, 
and the site in Suffolk um, with Foster Farms. Uh, my team are going out tomorrow to do the initial skin set measurements and then they'll be doing the final harvest next week. And that is effectively four weeks after the T1 application. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so where we were, this is last week, the very beginning of last week. This is the royal crop in, uh, in, in near Harper Adams. Um, it's the spot where site, you can see the, the vigor of the canopy there, but that's only effectively, looking at my watch, it's the 19th today, that's effectively around about the 11th of August, about three weeks ahead of where we would be expecting to desiccate this crop at the very end of August. So everything's been fast tracked um, in terms of application of, of, of T1 sprays, and you'll see that in a moment. But next slide, please. So this is the spot east site on the 30th of July. This was due to be desiccated um, on the around about the 15th to 18th of August. Um, and we pulled it forward in, in response to the manager at Foscas Farms, Mike, saying, I think your crop won't last to that period of time <clears throat> to mid-August. So we applied our T1 sprays on the 30th of July. You can see the canopy there, typical plot there. Next slide, please. And this is effectively the 10th of August, so it's 12 days later than that T1 application. These are the controls, so this is just natural death occurring. And you can see two things. One is the plot on the left has still got 40 to 50% ground cover, um, but you've lost 40 to 50% ground cover. The plot on the right, you can clearly see it is paler, fewer, uh, sorry, lower leaf area. And that's the one with 15% less nitrogen. So you can clearly see there the nitrogen had an effect on ground cover around this time. So this is the point where we're saying that crop was on the point of active senescence. We probably in hindsight caught it about five to seven days too late for getting a vigorous crop growing. Okay, next slide, please. And so this will be it, that basically 12 days after application of either a single dose of spotlight followed by a dose of gozai or Soltex tank mix with Spotlight followed by Gozai. So these have both had two applications at this stage. They're both effectively dead. Brittle stems, brown leaf material, no green leaf left on those crops. So almost instantaneous kill. Um, it took uh, seven to 10 days to kill these crops. And they were, were effectively at full ground cover when we took the first sprays down. Okay, and next slide, please. So just contrasting that. The flail on the right, you can see there, brown desiccated stems, no foliage. Pelagonic acid, I know Eric said, you know, the combination treatment he had this year, but again, you still got green material there. You've got green stems. It, it, it is slower. The ground covers support that um, in terms of treatment. So that has had pelagonic acid plus a, a spotlight treatment at this stage on T3 on the 10th of August. Okay, and next slide. And that's the end of the 2020 programme. So we are effectively at this stage already three sites into operating the uh, programme. And there will be one site that hopefully with the weather will start tomorrow. And the data will gradually become available. So I think by the 16th of September, as Eric has alluded to, there will be videos available and there will be much more data available on the 2020 programme. Thank you, David. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, really good insight into what's what's happening this year. Um, as you currently really say, we'll have more to say in September. Um, but if you could ask Eric to join us again um, for the Q and A, we've had quite a few questions coming through. Um, one, this is more about a discussion point um, than a question as such. The two are quite linked. Um, it's around the essence of the crop. Um, what are you using to assess and are you using any technology for monitoring it and predicting it and then um, to build on that um, using barrier rate nitrogen application to help manage that so i don't know who wants to kick us off on on that one okay i'll uh, i'll pitch first at the spot scotland uh, farm we have been engaging with tuber zone so we are looking at uh, images from uh, satellites and images from uh, drones 
to understand the spatial variability of canopy and canopy development across the field and that has been also ground truth by taking uh, post uh, tuber initiation looking at variability and tuber numbers uh, across the field as well and that has been used uh, or has been investigated as a an aid to the desiccation timing um, on commercial farms. Yeah, I, I, will add Eric, I will add to Eric's point is that if you have variable size distribution, often growers or agronomists or field staff who are taking measurements have to take an average of a size grading. And often the panic button is pushed when you have tubers reaching a maximum size in one dig and the whole field has to be desiccated. So having some intelligence on two things. One is the tuber population. And, and secondly, the potential for continuation of growth. So that's the canopy cover in those same highlighted areas. The two linked together will tell you, right, this crop in this particular part of the field or this particular pixel in the field could be desiccated later or needs to be desiccated earlier in terms of getting the optimum size distribution. And the technology is moving on. Um, I think a desiccation strategy is one really advantageous use of remote sensing because you can actually see very big areas and when you are looking at ground covers increasing often the field grows very uniformly or relatively uniformly it's when it all starts to come down in terms of senescence that the crops often deviate in terms of patches develop where they were all the same two to three weeks earlier and that would obviously make logical sense to kind of, and there may be some areas where you don't need to desiccate because the crop is actually dead already. Um, another question for you, Mark, just to, I know you, you covered it in the general summary, but um, just in black and white, if, um, if you're using PPOs only, so the spray only approach, does it matter for what you've seen last year and this season, which product you go with first or second? So last year's combinations were Gozai followed by Spotlight, Spotlight followed by Gozai, Gozai plus Spotlight followed by Gozai plus Spotlight, um, and then different combinations following a flail. And if you look at the individual treatments, there is no significant difference. But when you've got four or five combinations and you group them together and analyze them as a block, then there is no effect of the chemical type or what follows what or whether they're in combination. A single dose, as, as Eric has shown, that single doses are used, they're not used in combination in any trials. I think that's a waste of chemicals. So yes, it's one or the other. And it, it just happens traditionally that it seems to be spotlight first, followed by Gozai, followed by spotlight, followed by Gozai, if you're using four treatments. And I, I don't know whether that's a, an, a, the opposite of an alphabetical order or whether there's any logical reason. I've, I've not answered that one. And Maybe Eric. Eric yeah, have you seen anything contradictory to what Mark's saying? Or are you in agreement? I'm broadly in agreement. The the transition from using Dicot, uh, we have, as an industry, perhaps more experience with using spotlight. Therefore, we tend to uh, where we're using chemical only, we tend at this present point in time to lead with Spotlight Plus at a litre uh, and follow that through with, with Gozai. Um, Gozai plus Spotlight and then you've got uh, an option of um, Gozai as a, as a third treatment on a chemical only uh, approach. One thing that is worthy of note is that uh, Spotlight Plus have got has got a seven day harvest interval so if you were putting the fire out on any regrowth You've got slightly more wiggle room with the Spotlight Plus than you have with uh, with, with, with Gozai, um, but uh, they are both Gozai and Spotlight are both PPO inhibitors, and broadly they are very similar in their activity on a rate per rate basis. Speaking of on rates, another question has come in about um, work being done on reduced doses, um, and beginning the, the program um, at the beginning of the program. Um, for home reduction over two to three weeks, but using less more often, obviously within label where, where it allows. Okay, so we are with vigorous canopies in seed crops, 
and in later maturing crops such as uh, Coultra and, and the likes in Scotland, we are struggling now to, especially in duller overcast conditions, uh, bearing in mind that these PPO inhibitors require bright sunlight to be uh, at their maximum uh, efficacious activity. So we are at the cusp uh, of being able to manage or, or not manage. And if, if we reduce the rates, then we're going to prolong the period that it takes in order to remove the palm and the green material from the crop in terms of blight. You need to be at, at least 14, if not 21 days from cessation of all green material before you can categorically say that there's going to be little um, active blight in terms of zoospores present within, within the soil. That's important. And we have discussed this afternoon the inference of late uh, ingress of leaf roll or PVYN through the regrowth of the base of the stem, which is very attractive to aphids as vectors of uh, leaf roll or PVYN. So if we use lower rates, you're going to increase that period of time, you've got green material and you're going to increase disease and pest risk and virus risk. Mark, so you're keen to... Yeah, I can add, sorry, I mean, I think people need to go back, those you can remember, back to the, the DICOR reg loan days where the issue I raised about vascular staining, stem end necrosis, um, basically split those rates of DICOR. Some work by my, one of my former colleagues, David Furman at the time with Syngenta. We were able to take vigorously growing seed crops down in Wiltshire with half a litre of Reglone, and they were almost completely devoid of leaves after a week using that treatment. And so there is the potential, and I think Eric's green telephone is really key, is that if you can somehow convince that crop that it's about to die, split dose rates may help, but you've got to have the right conditions. And Reglone and Soltex might be more efficient at being contact than effectively PPO inhibitors. So I think Eric's totally right, but there is potential for doing it. If you could only spray at more frequent intervals with smaller doses, you can open the canopy up, the next dose down takes the next layer of leaves down and so on. So it's about layering the canopy. Sometimes we can take two layers off instantaneously. Other times it's almost like one layer at a time and you eventually run out of time if, if you've got four to five weeks of green material there. And as Eric said, if you want to kill the crop from a point of view of size or kill the crop from a point of view of ingress of blight or virus, it's got to be a lot quicker than that. And split doses may not do that, but it gives you a good option with where, I think. Another question that's come in is, again, based around that, and that's using light meters um, to monitor the situation when the, the products are applied. Um, the assumption being that the PPOs are going to work better in, in brighter sunlight. Um, I know last year, Mark, you were recording a lot of that at the sites, the weather conditions. Is this a pattern you're seeing across two years worth of trials? Yeah, I mean, we we pretty much stuck to the same time period during the day due to getting to sites, setting up and doing it. But we were largely mid morning and before midday on all the sites. <clears throat> but you can't influence the weather. So, you know, there were sites where that was done, you know, last year at JHI where it was remarkably dull and you know the consequences were that those chemicals were less efficient but also reglone was less efficient so it wasn't just pushing out the ppo treatments as being poorer everything seemed to be poorer so there is some work that um grant tomlin showed at the cupra conference last year and he's shown it elsewhere was the complete opposite of what eric said early morning with the maximum period of time is, is basically late afternoon into early evening and it almost looked like um, that the chemical hadn't been sprayed on when it was sprayed on late afternoon. So there's clearly a timing issue. How you can influence the light, you can measure it, but what do you do? Do you wait for it to be bright or so on? I think you can look at cloud cover you know, conditions. And if you move inexorably into late September, generally the days are less bright. <laughs> it can always buck the trend, but you will be ruining. So moving to earlier conditions, gives that opportunity for light levels to be higher. So Eric, Eric got his hand up there. Yeah, 
one other point in terms of the rate of removal of green material is it's important in a seed crop context that we remember the work that was done in the late, uh, uh, sorry, the early 2000s by Stuart Kanegi at Sasa that showed there was a very good correlation between the speed of home removal or home death and the expression of gangrene in the subsequent seed crop. Um, so where there was a complete home removal by home pooling, uh, it accorded with uh, about a 50% reduction of the gangrene on the subsequent crop. So the buildup of inoculum as the home is dying with the, the FOMA and FOMA species is quite important. So as a healthy seed crop, we want to get rid of that green material as rapidly as possible and lessen the time from the decision to desiccate the crop to uh, complete cessation of all green material and having skin set. I'll add to that that it's a very useful technique. It was applied by hand last year by operators um, at JHI and at the Sport North site, and it results in instant detachment of tubers. So all of the roots are snapped because you've pulled the plants, all of the stolons are broken away from the tuber, and any leaf material that has a photosynthetic capacity is removed as well. So the tuber then stays in the status and if you look at the data there are only two experiments where that is actually a treatment they are numerically one or two days faster in setting skin sets within the errors of the experiment that's not significant but they are clearly that direction but the practicalities of home pulling are not as simple um, as as it might seem um well, fantastic. Well, another um, interest time manage two questions and then we'll start to wrap things up and um, what question has come in about the um, thoughts on using boron um, in conjunction with chemical treatments um, have either of you had experience with it thoughts on it um, I don't believe with HDB we've done any trials on it but we're interested to, to hear from you both so um, Eric do you want to answer first uh, we, we have not applied any boron treatments in the desiccation process um, so I've got no data or experience I can add to the to the discussion on that. No, I just add anecdotal evidence. That's all, um, and I've seen no data uh, from experiments to to support it. So, yeah, no, I don't think very much. Well, um, the final so it's, it's more of a, a summary than a question. It's it remark come in about people recalibrating their expectations from desiccants rather than being horrified that things will take longer, um, and that perhaps some green leaf may remain for longer, but the the overall time to skin set and harvestability, which is what we're all aiming for, isn't quite as, as doom and gloom as, as feared two years ago, perhaps. Yeah, I, I would quickly get in there um, and say, yeah, issues of pathology um, and, and virology overweigh that. 3% leaf area is an infector potential for, a, for an aphid and blight can come in. Whereas for wear crops, does it matter? Crops senesce doesn't matter as much. Obviously, you know, with, with, with blight uh, control, people applying fungicides with desiccant programs. That was an issue last year that we discussed, but this year it's a standard program over the whole lot. So people are aware of it, that you've got to control blight. But, you know, clearly Eric has highlighted the issues where green leaf material should not be left for any longer than necessary. Sorry, Eric, I just jumped in there. but Yeah, uh, and I think, although I focused today very much on the uh, potential for the ingress of, of virus late season, if there isn't uh, an adequate insecticide program continued, then uh, I'm not I'm not uh, belying the, the risk that is associated with late blight. We've got a very aggressive uh, 36A2 uh, genotype of blight in, in the UK. We've not seen very much blight at all this season, but that doesn't mean it's not lurking around and could not come back uh, to bite us at the end of the season. There are crops being reported in Ireland and trials in Ireland that have gone from being uh, fully green to fully dead within 14 days and Aberyst with I believe are showing exactly the same uh, th this week. So where aggressive genotypes comes in, you've got a late maturing variety, they can act as blotting paper for any uh, blight is around at the end of the season and any regrowth will be very susceptible 
to the ingress of that. And it's, that's especially important if you've got a processing crop that you're trying to hold in store at eight or 10 degrees C over the storage period. Fantastic. Thank you both very much for your, your um, contribution and everything today. Um, been fascinating information. Um, as I mentioned, that the handouts are there with, with some of the summaries. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to get around to all the questions, but I am conscious of time and we have kept you longer than, than I initially promised. Um, there will be a short survey will pop up um, when this webinar finishes. Um, but as I said, it has been recorded, so anything you want to catch up, um, it will be sent out tomorrow um, all going well and will be on, on our website um, and YouTube. Um, if you have any questions um, that didn't get to anything you want clarified, that's my details on screen. Um, so please do get in touch um, with any questions you may have that have been unanswered. Um, we have uh, more webinars coming up. Um, we have a second part of the education webinar on the 16th of September, similar time. We, we may extend the runtime for it. Um, but that will be very much looking at a bit more of what we've seen, initial findings from this year's results, and hopefully have a few farmers' views of what they've done and why. Um, as we appreciate a seed grower in Scotland is very different to a, um, someone selling table potatoes, green top from, from the Suffolk coast. Um, in addition to that, if you want a bit more on, on desiccation, um, the podcast is latest edition is out now, um, where we have Mike Chaplin, the um, farm manager for James Hoskett Farms, the strategic farm east host, um, talking about how he tackles desiccation this year. Um, and uh, Mark Stallam again, talking through some of results from last year you've already seen. So um, I'd very much like to thank again our speakers, Mark and Eric, um, fantastic contribution today. Um, thank you all very much for joining us, staying with us, and hopefully see you again in a month's time. Thank you very much.